Hey y'all, with the major construction done on my Gatton CNC, I need to start thinking about laying down a spoil board. But before I can do that, I need to tram the router head. Now, this may or may not be necessary for your build. Now, there are some that'll say that if you build it right, you won't need to go through this. And that's, there's a lot to that, but it's not the final word. Uh, I know when I built my uh, shoestring budget CNC, I thought I had my router running nice and true to the table. Until it came time to surface a big slab like this one here. That's when I found out just how much twist I had in my router. So, when we talk about tramming the router, what we're talking about is two things. We're talking about the router being tilted to one degree or another, and obviously I'm exaggerating here, and we're talking about nod, which is front to rear, like so. Now, the tramming plates that I made in episode 10 of my Gatton CNC router build, and there's a link to that episode in the description box below, those tramming plates are going to help when it comes to adjusting the tilt, but they're not going to do a thing for me as far as adjusting the nod. For that, we're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way, which is loosen up the mount and tuck shims between the router plate, router mount plate, and the front of the Z box, either on the bottom or on the top, depending upon whether we need to bring that router back or move it forward slightly. But for the tilt, those tramming plates are going to come in handy. So let me go ahead and show you the tools that we're going to use for this, and then we'll get started. Okay, before we actually get into the tramming and the tools that we're going to use, I'm going to spend a couple more seconds talking about why you would want to tram. Now, if you just generally use small bits like this eighth inch end mill, or maybe even a quarter inch end mill, you may or may not even notice that you have a tramming issue. You know, if you don't think you have a problem, you probably don't. But it's when you get into larger bits like this one. Now this is an inch and a quarter diameter. It's actually a straight mortising bit. But it works really good for a makeshift fly cutter to uh, surface my spoil board or surface big slabs like the one that I showed you earlier. Things that are too big to go through my planer. Uh, it's when you get into a bit that's this big that you're really going to notice uh, a tramming issue if you have one. Because if your router is tilted just slightly, now I'm exaggerating greatly obviously, you'll notice that one side of the bit is cutting deeper into the material than the other side of the bit is. And what that does is instead of making a nice smooth cut, you're actually creating a series of uh, ridges and dips in the material. Now that's called shingling because as you step back and take a look at it, those ridges actually look like rows of shingles on a roof. Now if you're having issues like that, then tramming is what you need to do to get, try to get this router as flat and level, moving as level as possible. Now as far as tools are concerned, I've got this inexpensive dial indicator. Now, I got this online, and I'll leave a link in this description box below to the dial indicator I bought. It's less than $20. It's, um, you know, accurate enough for this purpose. Now, I have no delusions that this is as accurate as a dial indicator costing two or $300. But the accuracy of the indicator is less important than the consistency of the indicator. And I'll... I'll uh, explain that a little bit further when we actually get into leveling the next tool, this piece of glass. Now, why do we need a piece of glass here to begin with? Well, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adjusting the router to make sure it's running straight and true. So we need a level surface to reference from, to index off of. So what I'm going to do, this glass is going to serve as a level plane. I'm going to measure the four corners here and shim up where I need to to get this glass level on top of the table. Now the four blocks here are just uh, here to kind of capture this piece of glass to keep it from scooting around the table as it's sitting on these 
these slick shims that I have here. Four shims, you'll see I've got four playing cards here. And I got a, another, the deck over here. Playing cards run anywhere from 10 to 11 thousandths. So that'll help me to get this shimmed up to get it level. I've got some plain old printer paper here and I've got a few pieces of edge banding material. And that'll help me get this shimmed up and level so I can start taking readings. Now for mounting the dial indicator in the router, my uh, indicator has a lug mount. So I went ahead and I made a little attachment for the collet in my router. I have a half inch collet, so I took a piece of half inch dowel and I just kind of sanded a flat spot in the dowel so I can take the dial indicator and mount it like so, then chuck it up in the router. This will be used to index, to, uh, excuse me, take readings off the four corners and level it out. And I'll just attach the indicator with a 1024 nut and bolt. So those are the tools, it's pretty basic. I'll, uh, as I said, I'll leave a link in the description box below to this dial indicator. And um, we'll go ahead and get set up and start indexing the four corners and uh, shimming everything up. Okay, I've got my dial indicator mounted on my little dowel here and I've got this chucked up into the collet. It's uh, just hand tight. We will not be turning on the router. In fact, it's not even plugged in. And so now I'm going to go ahead and just move it over to whatever corner and start taking readings. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for the highest corner. Then I will shim the other three up and we'll try to get this piece of glass level. So. Now I have my CNC set up to where I can go into single step mode, meaning every time I hit the button on my controller, the uh, axis moves one single step. And that's what I'm doing now to bring it down to touch that piece of glass. There we go. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this down until that dial indicator reads zero. Okay, now I'm going to move around until I hit all four corners, but I won't be adjusting the Z at all unless I find a lower corner. Yep, take it out a single step. Okay, this corner here is almost 40 thousands higher. Let's see, I'll write this down as, as soon as I find a pencil, that is. I'll write this down as zero. I'll put plus, 40, plus 39 here. Now we'll scoot over to this corner. And this corner is 31 thou. And come forward to this corner. And this one is actually lower by 9,000. 
So this is my lowest corner here. My highest corner is this one over here. So what I'll need to do is make this zero and then shim the rest of these up to that corner. So Oop. Don't go off the glass. Okay, now I will adjust my Z so that this is set to zero. Switch into single step. Okay, we now have that set to zero. That's my highest corner. The other three need to be shimmed up to meet that. So I already know these need to come up. So I'll go ahead and tuck another shim underneath. Now with this set of zero, yeah, lifting these three brought this one down. So make sure that I'm down here and I will reset my zero here and now I'll check the other three corners against it. Yep, okay, I just raised that up. It's five too high. So we'll go. Okay, now I am completely off of the indicator here completely off the glass, so I'll have to raise this one up again. One more. Oops, not two, one. All right, one more. Okay, now I'm just a little bit, see I'm four thousands here. And I'm completely off the indicator again here. Okay, I'm about a thou and a half. Minus. Let's go back to my other corner. And this is what it's going to take. It's going to take going around and around until we get enough the right shim combination in here to where I'm reading zero at all four corners. Okay, I now have my piece of glass level. I went back around and checked 
a couple of times to make absolutely certain my glass is now a level plane here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce another little jig that I made and this is simply put uh, just a piece of three quarter inch plywood that I drilled a half inch hole here at this end and cut a slot. This will clamp around the dowel that's sitting in the router right now. And then I've got a couple of holes here. This rear one is the one I'm going to go ahead and clamp the dial indicator in. And I'll get it all set up and assembled and show you how this is going to work. Okay, I've got this, my little cross beam here slipped up onto the dowel and I've pushed the dowel into it. I think you can see that until this is clamping up above the little flat spot here. I don't want it trying to pinch this here. I want to get it around the full diameter of the dowel. Now I'll go ahead and I'll chuck this up in the bottom of the router. Just again, hand tight. Then I can put my dial indicator back into this rear hole down firmly and then tighten up the clamp. so that the indicator doesn't move. All right, there we go. Now we're all set. We're ready to go ahead and start taking readings. Okay, once again, there isn't really a good place to put the camera where I can get all of this in frame. So what I'm doing now is I'm checking the nod on my router. And I highly recommend that you make this adjustment first, mainly because if you adjust the tilt now, when it comes time to adjust the nod, all of that work you did in adjusting the tilt is going to be lost. Because the, in adjusting the nod, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take a measurement with my dial indicator back here. Uh, f find the lowest spot, uh, set that to zero, bring the dial indicator back here, and take a measurement. Then that difference will divide by two, take a shim approximately that thick, loosen up the mount, and put it either on the front or the uh, either on the uh, top here between the router mount and the front of the uh, Z box, either on the top or on the bottom, depending upon which way we need to shim. So I've gone ahead and I brought my router down and this was the lowest edge on this setup with this reaching out this direction and I've got it set to zero. Now if I spin my dial indicator around this way, I can see right now that I'm about eight thousandths out, meaning that the top of my router is actually shifted forward uh, eight thousandths. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to loosen up the mount and tuck a four thousandths shim under there, tighten it back down, and then measure this again. The reason I'm going to go with four thousandths is because when I pull this out, that's actually going to push that back just slightly. So I'll go ahead and I'll put a four thousandths shim down here on the bottom between the uh, router mount and the front of the Z box to try to shift the router out this way. Now I've got a self imposed um, error of five thousandths. And what I mean by that is if I can get this shim to within five thousandths of flat out zero difference between here and here, then I'm going to consider that good enough. I'm not looking for NASA accuracy here. I'm looking to get, I mean, obviously if I can get zero, great, I'll go for it. But if I can get less than five thousandths, I'm going to consider, I'm going to be happy with that. So, let me go ahead and pull all this, pull this loose, 
tuck my shim underneath and go for it. Now what am I using for shims? Um, I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice an old feeler gauge. Uh, I've got this blade type of feeler gauge and I've got a four thousandth blade here. I'm going to go ahead and loosen up the four mounting bolts, tuck this in behind, secure it all down, then take another reading again. Okay, I installed my 4,000th shim, got everything tightened back up, and spun my router around, and it did throw off my zero. I've got it reset to zero back here, and now I'm going to spin my dial indicator around, see what I got. <laughs> okay, now I have a self-imposed 5,000th tolerance here. So I figure if I can get it within five thousandths from front to rear, I'm good. I'm currently sitting at about one and a half thou. So I probably could pull that four thousandths out and put in a five thousandths and get down to zero, maybe, but I'm not going to mess with it. I'm going to call it good enough for me. That's one and a half thousandths. The router head is tilted forward at the top. Tilted forward. That's good enough for me. Now I'm going to move on to adjusting the tilt. And this is going to be a little bit more fun because in order to read the dial indicator, I got to go around to the back of the machine. So let me change camera angle so I can move around and we shall see what we shall see. Okay, now once again, there's no real good place to set up this camera. I'm trying to get it set up to where you can see it as best as possible. And I know that I just said that I was putting a self-imposed limit of five thousandths of an inch. I don't know if I'm just lucky or somebody's an angel's watching over me or what, but I've set this side to zero. Then I spun this around, went back to the other side to check and use this little makeup mirror. I don't know if you can see, probably not. I'm four thousandths out now. This side here is four thousandths, reading four thousandths higher. So that means I've got four thousandths of tilt counterclockwise. That's within my margin of error, but I think I'm going to try to go ahead and see if I can adjust that out a little bit more and maybe get that closer to zero. So the way I'm going to do that, I've got all my screws here, set screws on my uh, tramming plates loose. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tighten down this one and this one while these are backed all the way out and see if I can adjust that four thousandths down a little bit better. So let's give it a shot, see what we get. Let me loosen up the mount just slightly and we'll go from there. Okay, I've loosened these bolts about a quarter of a turn. 
I'm trying to do what I can to keep that shim from falling out. So let's see if I get any kind of a change. That moved to the thousands by itself. Okay, I'm reading zero. Let me flip around here. Okay, and that moved that about a thou. So let me go back off a little bit here. Okay, I'm reading one, one thou here. About one thou here, so let me bump down my Z, or bump up my Z, one step. That's my zero, spin it around, and I'll go back there and look at it one more time. <laughs> I have it reading zero. Front and rear. So, I'm reading dead on zero. Now, we make sure these are bottomed out. We'll tighten up the set screws on the tramming plate, or the lock nuts rather. Still reading zero. Still reading zero. Now, to lock down the plate, and that's really going to make that needle move. Okay. Okay, I'm reading one thou here. About a half a thou here. So that did move everything. Let me go ahead and bump my zero. Okay. <laughs> okay, after getting everything tightened down and secured, I have one half thou counterclockwise tilt. That really exceeds my expectations. That's more than good enough. So those are the steps that I took to tram my router in my Gatton CNC. Now, from start to finish, this took me about two hours to do, but I do know that it can take longer. I've known some people who have said that it's taken them four or five, even six hours to do, depending upon you know how much adjustment they have to make. Now, if you didn't install these tramming plates on your Gatton CNC, I'll put a link in the description box below to that episode of my CNC build series. And I'll also put a link to, my, to the article on my website where you can go take a look at the measured drawings and possibly make a set of tramming plates for your CNC. Now, before I close this out, I'm going to throw you a couple of tips here. And this I learned the hard way. Make sure that when you, before you start tramming, you have the router that you are going to use in your CNC installed and clamped down firmly, oriented the way you want it oriented, meaning switches mounted where they're convenient or what have you. Because the minute you loosen up these clamps or make any changes, you'll have to start this all over again, okay? Now, I'm also sure that you have seen the pretty anodized aluminum uh, tramming rig that's available online that has two dial indicators side by side facing forward for your convenience. And that is an excellent option. 
Um, I won't say anything bad about them because I can't say anything bad about them. I mean, it's an excellent option. Just for the money right now, it's not, not in the cards for me. So that's why I came up with using the inexpensive dial indicator, about a four inch long piece of half inch dowel and about a six inch long piece of scrap plywood to mount the indicator into the router and go from there. Now this may not be an option for you. You might not have a half inch collet, but whatever option is going to work for you the best is the best option for you, obviously. So now that I've got it all set up and ready to go, I'm ready to lay down a spoil board and surface it. Those of you who are a little bit more observant may notice some material leaning up against the wall that wasn't there in the last video. That's right. Next episode, we'll be laying down a spoil board and surfacing it. Then maybe I can actually get to using my Gatton CNC. So I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up down there. Now, I put a link in the description box below to Dave Gatton's homepage where you can get information on a Gatton CNC kit and build one of these yourself. Now, whether you subscribe to me or not, I'd like to thank you very, very much for taking the time to watch this video, and y'all take care.